What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. It's your man's Nicholas. Big dogs gotta eat fantasy football, BDGE. It's Tuesday, so you know we're dropping the waiver wire video. Uh, I apologize for missing last week's <clears throat> video. Ooh, sorry, I was traveling. Um, I had some marketing clients I was going to visit in Denver, but as always, guys, if you miss, if I don't have the videos posted, I'll always have the blog post version of the video posted on the website bigdogfantasy.com on the homepage you could scroll right down sign up for the newsletter and I'll shoot you out an email letting you know that I don't have the video coming for y'all that week uh, with that being said this is looking at week seven so hopefully hopefully through six weeks you've got a few dubs under your belt if you're 0 six I don't want to say uh, I don't want to say you're out of it but uh, it might be time to tank however if you're not 0-6, then you still got some mojo going and you could still make the playoffs regardless of what your record is and you do that through good waiver wire moves. So heading into week seven, we are going to look at the top waiver wire pickups of guys owned in 55% or less of Yahoo leagues. And as always, I do this on Monday night or prior to Monday night. So you guys could see this, 116, Monday, October 15th for y'all. I think I'd be lying. I do this because I filmed this prior to Monday Night Football, so uh, a lot of the guys on Monday Night Football won't be on this list. So I just want to tell you guys a few guys to look out for that might make an impact. It might be waiver wire pickups that I won't include in the video. The first of which, it's uh, it's Green Bay against San Francisco. So you look at the Green Bay side of things, and apart from injuries, Aaron Jones is the only guy I want to own in that backfield, so he's not going to be owned in less than 55%. But you look at the wide receiver group, right? And you have Randall Cobb, you have Geronimo Allison who have missed games and have missed practice time and have been banged up. You have Marcus Valdez-Scantling. So these guys are, I think Cobb is owned in 57% of leagues. Geronimo Allison is owned in 40%, 47% of leagues. MVS, 11%. Equinemia St. Brown, 0%. So we're going to have to keep an eye on the injury reports and keep an eye on <clears throat> how these guys play. Um, if Allison is back, he would be my top ad uh, among these guys. If Allison and Cobb continue to miss time, then Marcus Valdez-Scantling is the guy that I'm considering picking up here. So just keep an eye on the wide receiver group for the Packers. On the flip side of things, we have San Francisco. Um, C.J. Bethard, who's taking over as the quarterback in place of Jimmy Garoppolo, who is out for the year. So he's averaging 324 passing yards, and he has thrown for multiple touchdown passes in both games since Jimmy G has left the vicinity. You don't want to start C.J. Bethard, but if this team is going to be trailing a lot, if they're going to be throwing the ball a lot more, with him than Jimmy G, then he could end up putting up some useful fantasy days for you, especially if you're in a two quarterback league. Now in week seven, they get the Rams at home. So that is definitely a matchup in which the Rams could destroy this defense and you know force Bethard to throw the ball upwards of 40 times in this game. So that's uh, that's someone to keep an eye on, as well as you know the same thing on the other side of the ball, the wide receiver group, the weapon group for this 49er team. They have a ton of injuries going on as well. What I will say is this is the first time Marquise Goodwin, you know, he was widely viewed as like a fifth to seventh round pick in fantasy games and fantasy leagues this year, this summer. He is practicing fully for the first time in a long time. He had missed like three games in a row, I believe, and now he is back to full health, and he's only owned in 41% of leagues. Now, Dante Pettis has been ruled out already for week six. Garcon is banged up in less than 100%. Trent Taylor is doubtful for the game. They really have no wide receivers left on this team. Goodwin is really um, the top wide receiver. By, he is the best wide receiver on the team, but he's now the top wide receiver by default because everyone else is banged up. He is actually, I think Loki is going to have a pretty good game tonight, and I wouldn't be surprised. I think I'm actually starting him somewhere in uh, a 12-team league where I own like T.Y. Hilton and uh, a few other wide receivers that are banged up. So he is actually in my lineup. Thankfully, I think I've already locked up that game. But Goodwin, I think, will have a big week, and then people are going to be wanting to add him on the wire. So hopefully... Um, you know, you already kind of stashed him, or at least you are looking towards that because they play the LA Rams next week, who their secondary obviously has not been great. So those are the guys to look out for for Monday Night Football. But let's jump into the actual position by position breakdown. All right, so we have a few quarterbacks to go through, uh, four of them in particular that could be streaming options for you in week seven. First of which, and this is in order of percentage owned in the Yahoo leagues, not by order of guys that I would like on my team. Um, if you want to look at how much I would spend on fab budget wise, you could look at the blog post. It has all the breakdowns of that stuff. First on this list is Baker Mayfield of the Cleveland Browns owned in 42% of leagues. Uh, now the, the brutal part of Mayfield's schedule is done with, and now comes the cake, the juice, 
the precious part of the schedule for Baker Mayfield. Now, I know this was not a, uh, a great performance by him by any means in this game against the Chargers at home. Uh, I thought he would fare a little bit better, but he gets Tampa Bay. That all but assures a uh, almost probably a quarterback one performance out of the rookie. And, you know, looking at Tampa Bay and the fantasy numbers that they have given up the quarterbacks is kind of outrageous this year. There is no quarterback that has thrown for less than 334 yards against this defense. Over their last three games, the Bucks have allowed 12 passing touchdowns to opposing quarterbacks. Baker Mayfield gets Tampa Bay at Pittsburgh, Kansas City at home, Atlanta at home, a ridiculous slate of matchups. So again, I've been saying this for a few weeks and obviously the tough matchups were the ones you probably didn't want to play him in. Now he gets his four game skid against ridiculously easy opponents. Grab him off your waiver wire and stream him with confidence in week seven. Second on this list is Mitch Trubisky of the Chicago Bears, 29%. I gotta be honest, man, I almost wrote him off after the first few weeks of the season. He had a brutal start um, over the first, I think it was three, maybe four, yeah, three games, I think it was, um, by passing standards and just looking at him from the eye test. And he still is making some questionable decisions at the quarterback position, but he has bounced back in a big way over the last two games um, that the Bears have played in, right? Coming off of their week five bye, Trubisky threw for 316 yards on Sunday and three touchdowns uh, against a previously, previously feared Miami Dolphins passing defense uh, who have allowed the second fewest fantasy points to opposing quarterbacks on the year. Now, Trubisky seems to be finding the groove. This offense is clearly clicking together a little bit more, and now he has thrown for over 315 passing yards and a total of nine passing touchdowns over the last two weeks, which is going to give you quarterback one numbers, obviously, um, which actually isn't a given this year con considering how ridiculously high the passing numbers have been inflated because of the way the league is gone, but that's neither here nor here. Um, next week, they will get a home game against New England, who have allowed back-to-back -back quarterback performances of over 350 passing yards and three passing touchdowns. The game will have a over-under total of 50 points. Um, now, I'm not completely sold on Trubisky. Like I said, I don't think that... Um, I, I think there are plenty of mistakes ahead, and I think that some of the question uh, throws he makes are still questionable, um, and some of them should have been intercepted, and his numbers should be a little bit lower than they are. But he's caught some breaks... Um, and what's a little bit more concerning is a low level of passing attempts that he's actually getting. And that's still somewhat concerning because, like, he's being super efficient over the last few weeks. But if he, you know, if a couple breaks go the other way, then he won't be putting up those big games. Um, he has yet to throw the ball more than 35 times in a game this year. And he currently ranks 24th in the NFL among quarterbacks in pass attempts. So I think we'll get a better idea of Trubisky over the next few weeks. But he's not a bad streaming option against New England, which should be a high scoring game in week seven. Third on the list is Joey Flacco, Baltimore. Um, and if you've rostered Flacco, right, I've been talking about rostering Flacco over the last few weeks because of how he's been playing over the, um, you know, throughout the year so far. But, like, you probably shouldn't have been playing him over these last two games, right? He played at Cleveland and at Tennessee. Now, either, neither of those games are uh, pushover games. And they're on the road. So if just like defenses, if you have if if you're, if you're choosing like a tiebreaker between streaming two quarterbacks, I would rather play the home quarterback than the away quarterback. Um, and again, neither of these were easy at Cleveland at Tennessee. He did manage to throw for almost 300 yards against Cleveland, um, and they basically just didn't need him against Tennessee as they got up really big early and just leaned on the run game and their defense to kind of lock down the game. But in Week Seven, Joey Flacco will have a much easier time finding success through the air at home versus the New Orleans Saints defense who have allowed the third most fantasy points to the quarterback position in 2018. Just like uh, Mr. Trubisky, this game has an over-under of 50. They expect a pretty high amount of points to be scored in this one. So I would not be scared to stream Joey Flacco. Lord Flacco in Week 7 at home against the Saints. They take, uh, uh, they take on Carolina week after that, and then Pittsburgh the week after that. So he has, he has three matchups in a row in which you could stream this guy. Fourth on this list, and this is, <laughs> I know this is going to be a little ridiculous following his week six performance, but Eli Manning, man, owned in 22% of leagues. For as bad as he has been, or as bad as he was last week, he is still a streamable option in week seven, and that is because he's playing in Atlanta. They have allowed the fourth most fantasy points to the quarterback position, and, uh, you know, they should heavily rely on Saquon Barkley, to rack up receptions and rack up receiving yards as well as Odell over the middle and short passes. That, that's the kind of stuff that the Atlanta defense lets up. 
Now, Eli's last two road games have resulted in stat lines of 326 passing yards and two touchdowns and 297 passing yards and two touchdowns. The Falcons, on the other hand, have played four home games in 2018. The four opposing quarterbacks have thrown for at least 335 passing yards and three touchdowns. Of the four games, no quarterback has gone for less than 335 passing yards or less than three passing touchdowns, which is a ridiculously high rate of production that they're allowing to the quarterback position. So if there's ever a time you're desperate and you are looking to stream Eli, now would be that time in Atlanta. So he gets Atlanta, and then he's Washington at home before a bye. And we will move on to the running back positions. And guys, if you ever want to get my rankings, my weekly rankings, or you want a private live stream, which I do every Wednesday night, um, you can head over to patreon.com slash bdge. That is a way for you to support me as a creator, uh, as well as get some exclusive content I don't put out on YouTube or I don't put out on the blog. It's uh, rankings, private live stream. I answer 100% of the questions that come my way on Patreon. I can't get to all the social questions that I get between Twitter and YouTube, obviously, and uh, the master stat sheet and a bunch of other uh, other exclusive things that I do on Patreon. So if you want to head over there, patreon.com slash BDGE, that's where you can find more exclusive content from your boy um, and get my rankings. So we'll move on to the running back position. First up on this list is Latavius Murray. He's 49% owned in Yahoo Leagues. Now, this is just clear-cut evidence that the NFL makes no fucking sense whatsoever. Um, and this game just defined that. If that's, that's a nice oxymoron. It defined that it makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, Dalvin Cook was supposedly supposed to get, you know, a large handful of snaps in this game. Somewhere from like 20 to 30 snaps in this one. And then in pregame warm-ups, they decided that he either wasn't healthy enough, he had a tweak in his hamstring, or he might have aggravated the hamstring further, which will keep him sidelined for another week or two weeks. So we'll have to keep an eye on the reports out of Minnesota, but that's obviously not good news if you are a Cook owner. This suggests that he's still probably a bit far from returning, right? Now, Murray had been awful in 2018 prior to Sunday, but then he rushed for 155 yards on 24 carries and a touchdown. Again, makes no fucking sense after like four horrible games in a row, then you're finally like, okay, I'm done with Murray. Even if Cook is out, Murray goes in, explodes, whatever. If Cook hits again, and judging by him saying, you know, in this last week, he was like, I will not suit up unless I'm 100%, which makes no sense considering they were like, oh, we're going to limit his snap counts. Like, he's either 100% healthy, like he said, or he's not. And if he is 100%, you give him a full workload. You don't put him in there at 70 80% because this is the kind of shit that happens. So unless he's 100%, he's not going to play. And that suggests that he probably will miss another game or two. Again, I ain't no doctor. Um, so we'll have to watch out for reports, but if Cook is out again, Murray will obviously have a decent amount of volume coming his way. This one game, I will say, won't wipe away, like, the four or five horrible games he's had prior to this game. Um, this was against the Cardinals defense, who have been awful against the run so far. So, as far as I'm concerned, they play on the road at New York uh, against the Jets, who have been a pretty good defense so far. They've been mediocre against running backs in terms of fantasy points, but um, they're definitely better than the Cardinals. So I will pencil in Murray as like a low-end RB2, RB3 if Cook sits again. Um, he's someone I would probably use between like, I don't know, 6 to 10 bucks if you are desperate for a running back. Definitely not the number one waiver wire spot on it. Second on this list, Marlon Mack of the Indianapolis Colts, owned in just 26% of Yahoo leagues. Now, Mack had been pretty much a stash up to this point because we had no idea what we were getting out of the Colts' backfield, right? Um, in the hopes that when Mack did return, that we would see something similar to what we actually did end up seeing on Sunday. Now, Mack ran really well. 89 yards on 12 carries. He caught one of two targets for another four yards, so 93 total yards on 13 touches. Those 89 rushing yards were the highest total among any Colts running back in a single game up to this point. So he's clearly the best runner in that backfield, and they want to use him so, right? Even Frank Wright came out last week and said, Marlon is our starter when healthy. Um, but that was always the big question. Now it seems that, you know, Mac is 100% healthy and ready to go uh, and ready to roll and be the, I don't want to say the workhorse because Naeem Hines is still going to be heavily involved, right? So Max still trailed Naeem Hines in terms of snaps, 39 to 20, uh, 30 to 24. So the gap is getting pretty close. But after three straight weeks of being on the field for over 65% uh, of Indianapolis's snaps, Hines was only on the field for 43% of the snaps on Sunday. Um, so that number's coming down with Will, uh, with Marlon Mack back healthy. Jordan Wilkins didn't get a single snap in the game, so Mack is clearly way over Wilkins on the depth chart. Robert Turbin was actually, you know, he, he came back from the suspension. He was getting more involved in the offense, uh, and then he left the game with what appeared to be a somewhat serious shoulder injury. So 
I, uh, it seems like he was in a lot of pain. Maybe a separated shoulder. I'm not really sure. We'll have to keep an eye on reports. But if he's out, that's obviously only more floor and upside for Marlon Mack getting more playtime on the field. So what else is interesting is Naeem Hines only saw three targets on Sunday, where Marlon Mack saw two targets. And Naeem Hines, in the games where Mack was not playing, saw eight and a half targets a game. So that is a big discrepancy between when Mack is on the field and when Mack is not on the field. I will say it's hard to trust Marlon Mack as anything more than like a desperate flex play, given you know he might. We don't know what the game script's going to be. If Indianapolis gets down very quickly, um, Naeem Hines might jump back up to a 65 to 70 percent snap guy. We don't really know, but they're going to try to establish a run with Mack early, and clearly he's the best talent they have in the backfield. So he's uh, he's more of a desperate flex play for now, but he could absolutely develop into the main guy in that backfield, and I could see him putting up you know low RB2 with upside numbers over the second half of the season. So he's someone you're going to want to stash on your bench. Um, his next three matchups, Buffalo at home, at Oakland, bye. Would I use the number one waiver on him? Depending your league size, if it's a big league and you need a running back, then yeah, I probably would. Um, if it's a smaller league and you're just doing it for depth, I wouldn't go crazy on it. Um, I would spend somewhere between like 8 and $15, depending on how uh, how running back needy you are. And the last running back on this list is Edo Smith of the Atlanta Falcons. 9% owned. What you're pretty much getting out of Edo Smith is Tevin Coleman as long as Devonta Freeman is out. So Tevin Coleman plays the Devonta Freeman role. Edo Smith is basically the Tevin Coleman, the complementary piece to Tevin Coleman. So Freeman's battling both knee and foot injuries. The foot injuries basically kind of popped up out of nowhere after last week's game and then forced him to miss week six game. And the Fal uh, the Falcons, <clears throat> um, you know, started Tevin Coleman, of course, in his place. This is the fourth game that Freeman has missed on the year. Now, Edo Smith, while he hasn't been particularly efficient he's had some good flash plays and he's shown that he's a pretty good player and they're going to keep giving him volume he scored three touchdowns in as many games so he has back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back weeks which he's uh which he's found pay dirt so that's um you know, it's encouraging to see that they're using him you know in the red zone and by the goal line and stuff like that so he's a deeper ed and he will obviously be unplayable if devonta freeman is active on game day but you could do worse than Edo Smith if Freeman is not active. I expect him to have a floor of, you know, almost double-digit touches as well as some work near the end zone. So um, the Falcons are averaging like 31 points per game as an offense over the last five games. If you exclude that week one game, which is kind of funny because I remember like um, week one when we, you know, Falcons played the Eagles in week one. Thursday Night Football was a big game. We ended up losing. We looked horrible on offense. And everyone was like, oh, my God, I want to drop Matt Ryan. And I was like, yeah, he looked terrible, but like we get – five out of the seven next games at home so i would like hold on to ryan and i'm like damn imagine you drop matt ryan and um after week one if you were like desperate at quarterback that would have been a shitty ass move so hopefully you didn't do that but um yeah they've had averaged 31 points per game as an offense since losing to the eagles obviously it's because their defense is terrible lighting up a lot of points they need to score on offense and that works in favor of everyone on the offense including ito smith this is a game with a 54 and a half point over under in week uh, in week seven. They play the Giants at home in Atlanta, which is one of the highest totals of the week. So you could definitely do worse than um, Ito Smith. Uh, and before we move on to the wide receivers, uh, a couple other guys that, you know, just to start thinking about if you want to get cute or if you have room, I I've gotten a lot of questions about Deonta Foreman. What are my thoughts on Deonta Foreman? I will say this, and it's funny because I wrote this, I wrote this early Monday morning. It's, it's 1.30 now. I probably wrote this piece maybe at like 10 a.m. before any of the reports came out. And people keep asking me like, oh, should I should I pick up Deonta Foreman given that, you know, their backfield has been terrible pretty much. Lamar Miller and, and Alfred Blue have been replacement level at best. And Deonta Foreman is coming off the pup list, right? He tore his Achilles in 2017. He was looking promising. He was getting more work and more work. And, you know, it seemed like he was going to overtake Lamar Miller by the end of the year. Tears his Achilles and he's been out since then. Now he's eligible to return next week. However, this is an injury, right? That we know this. We have studies and we have a lot of things done where running backs, let any no, no player, let alone running backs, really come back from this successfully. Or no running backs have. Some players have, but running backs particularly struggle uh, a ton with this injury and trying to come back from it. And really, guys, we, we hadn't heard a positive report about Deonta Foreman in like five months. The only thing we heard, and this is the reason why I probably got so many questions, is there was like a blurb that came out of Bill O'Brien like, oh, he's expected to be active. He's expected to um, return when he is eligible to be activated off the pup list, which would be week seven. Um, and I was saying like, dude, I have no trust in Deonta Foreman getting involved and really working into a, a big role in his offense. And I wrote like, if... If he does end up getting a role into this offense, I don't think it'll come until like week 10. 
and I think it's going to take a lot of time, and they're going to merge him back very slowly into this backfield. And then all of a sudden, like five minutes before I started filming this, a report came out from the Houston Texans about down to Foreman. Uh, let me pull it up. So, yeah, 12.55 p.m., so this was like 20 minutes ago. Texans coach Bill O'Brien does not expect Deonta Foreman to be activated this week. I don't think he's quite ready. If he's not quite ready right now, he is not going like he is not going to make a role in this offense for like another month at least. So guys, if you're thinking about picking him up and using a, a roster spot on him right now, I, I think you're trying to get too cute, and I think you're going to end up wanting to drop him after a couple weeks. So I would say unless you have a ton of room, right? You have like seven guys to drop, and you have a lot of bench spots, and you want to pick him up. Go for it, but otherwise, I would not get my expectations high for Deonta Foreman in 2018. The other guy I was going to say is Chris Ivory because the trade deadline is two weeks. If you're watching this now, it's two weeks from today, October 30th. And obviously, there have been a lot of reports about LaShawn McCoy getting traded, whether it's the Eagles, whoever it's going to be to. And uh, Chris Ivory is the number two there in Buffalo. So if you have any inkling that LaShawn McCoy is going to get traded, then Chris Ivory is a guy you might want to stash because he will be a volume guy once Ivory is gone. It's obviously not a good play because it's a terrible offense, and um, you don't even know what you're going to get from Ivory week to week, but he's just some someone to think ahead of. I'll probably include him again in next week's waiver wire pickup to give you a reminder for the trade deadline, but just wanted to throw that in there to keep that top of mind. And we'll move on to the wide receiver positions. Before we do that, I want to thank today's sponsors to the video. As always, it's fantasyjocks.com. Hooking us up. Yeah, we're still ghetto up in here. I might have upgraded the quality. I might have upgraded the production value and whatnot. Oh, God. I need to dust this bad boy off, as you can see. I ain't really been using this belt too much. I ain't been hitting people over the head like WWF with it, as it should be. Anyways, FantasyDocs.com has got all the gear you need for your fantasy league. It's got draft boards if you're doing your fantasy basketball draft or hockey draft or whatever. I don't even know when the season starts for hockey, to be honest with you. But... If you are doing any fantasy sports, they have your league covered with draft boards. They have your league covered with championship rings, with championship belts, with championship trophies. You can get the championship team name engraved on the side each year. So it becomes a thing, right? Make your league that much better by getting one of these things. They're not that expensive. Everyone could chip in five, eight, ten bucks, depending on the product you want to get. And uh, it's that simple. It's really not expensive if you're splitting it between 10, 12, 14 dudes. So check out fantasyjocks.com. Use promo code TAKE10 or TACO Corp for 10% off your purchase. Um, and yeah, that'll be linked down below. So let's jump into the wide receiver. Actually, you know what else? Since we're talking about upgrading to HQ, I know y'all see that big dog's um, sign up in the background. Now, Steve got that for me. And I haven't hung it up yet, obviously. I'm gonna probably put it in place of Chance the Rapper. However, it's not just the poster. Check this motherfucker okay, out. Oh, it's already on. Woo! Hope y'all can see that. I think you can. Let me shift the camera a little bit if you cannot. That's like a neon light, beautiful, gorgeous sign. Big Dog's got to eat. I'm not going to leave that on because I feel like it's probably blinding in the background. But I just want to show y'all a little bit of upgrade, man. I can't wait to end up uh, wherever my next living situation is going to be. I'm going to create a beautiful studio. The, the, the real HQ there. And uh, I'm gonna make this thing incredulous, and that is just another addition to it. So Steve hooked me up with that. His girlfriend's like uncle or grandpa or something makes those. That's like what he does for a living, which is kind of epic. So if anyone actually wants one of those for some custom design or whatever, uh, this is not a promo. I'm not gonna make money off this, obviously, but I know a guy who knows a guy that can be your guy. So let me know. Um, and let me know what you think about that goddamn sign. It's pretty epic. And leave a thumbs up if you are enjoying the video thus far. If you have gotten value from it, if you have any questions, you can leave a comment down below. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. We're doing this shit week in, week out at the HQ. As always, let's move on to wide receivers. First up on this list is Mohamed Sanu. Um, and he's been on the list for a while now. He's 51% owned. The problem with this is he was limited all week with a hip injury. Uh, and then he ended up leaving the game with a hip injury as well. So you're going to have to monitor his status. Calvin Ridley also left the game with an ankle injury, and he could not return. So it's possible that they're without their uh, two of their top three receivers next week. If uh, Mohamed Sanu is playing and Calvin Ridley is not playing, Mohamed Sanu will be in a wonderful, wonderful position to uh, really dominate for your league. They play the Giants again at home, and Sanu is now has four straight weeks of double-digit fantasy points. And probably I think he's averaging 12 or 13 fantasy points per game over the last four weeks. And, uh, and he's been, like, low-key, very, very, very consistent for you in an offense. Again, like I said, averaging 31 points per game. So keep an eye on 
the injury reports and, and what's going on there in Atlanta. If neither of them play, or if one of them misses games, Justin Hardy is the next guy up. He would be playing as a wide receiver three. Um, he caught, I think, three balls for 33 yards when he took over last game. And um, he's not someone I would really add unless it's like a very deep league because they only run three wide receiver sets on, I think, 63% of their plays. So he's not going to be a full-time player either way unless both of them miss the game. That's something just to keep an eye on. So um, we'll move on to the second guy, and that is Kiki Cutie. Houston Texans owned in 47% of leagues. He finally kind of came back down to earth in week six. Um, he caught just three passes for 33 scoreless yards. Could have had a much bigger day, but Watson kind of missed him and underthrew him on a deep pass that could have went for um, a long gain, if not a touchdown. Uh, but those aren't always going to work out, of course. So we can't just be like, oh, he should have had this, should have had that, because Watson takes a lot of deep passes. But that works in the favor of all the wide receivers. He's not a, afraid to chuck it deep, and now he's throwing it to QT. So he's not afraid to chuck it deep to the rookie, which is uh, obviously good news. Now, he's been playing on around 75% of the snaps, and that's with Will Fuller back in the lineup. So that's good to see, and he's going to be heavily involved um, and continue to be a piece of this offense going forward and for the remainder of the season. As for how much and how much you know production he's going to have, that's going to be tough week over week. I would say I probably wouldn't um, be comfortable with him in my flex spot unless it is a good matchup, which is not the case in Week 7. They travel to Jacksonville on the road. Um, although Jacksonville just got lit up by Dallas Cowboys and Cole Beasley at the slot. So that is actually something to um, to mention. So keep an eye on the um, reports out of Jacksonville in terms of um, Deshaun Gibson coming back. Their safety, one of the best covered safeties. And uh, Kiki Cutie could be a good pickup and stream this week. Third on this list is my boy. Y'all know I love Chris Godwin, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, 44% owned. Now, guys, I've said this. Before, I said it before last week, um, I actually started Chris Godwin in multiple spots. Him and James Winston have legitimate chemistry, guys. Like, we saw it last year when either D-Jax or James Winston were hurt, or uh, Mike Evans were hurt. We saw it in the preseason. This year, they were connecting on touchdowns, um, and we saw it again in Winston's first game back. In his first start, Godwin outsnapped Deshaun Jackson, 37 to 34. So it's still tight, but it's good to see that he actually outsnapped Deshaun Jackson. He hauled in a team high six receptions. He saw nine targets for 56 yards and he scored his fourth touchdown on the year. He had 22% of the target share in Tampa Bay in Winston's first week back, which is obviously great news. Now he's found the end zone in every game this year, except one. As long as Jameis is under center and putting up ridiculous Fantasy numbers. I know Winston looks like shit sometimes when he's throwing the ball, but he's going to continue to put up really good fantasy numbers. Um, Godwin will provide you with a high floor and a high touchdown probability week over week. They get Cleveland at home, then they're at Cincinnati, at Carolina. The good thing about like the matchups for Godwin is he will never be the guy that defenses zone in on, right? So they play against Cleveland, um, and they will be worried about taking away Mike Evans or OJ Howard. Um, same thing with like Cincinnati, Carolina. So Godwin, I don't want to say he's matchup proof whatsoever, but he is a really, really, really solid wide receiver to play um, for fantasy football purposes. So. Chris Godwin, number three on the list. Number four is Taylor Gabriel, 22% owned in Yahoo Leagues. Um, coming into week four of this year, Taylor Gabriel had zero 100-yard receiving games in 59 career NFL games. He now has back-to-back 100-yard -back receiving games with the Chicago Bears after Sunday's five-catch 110-yard performance. In week seven, like I said with Mitchell Trubisky, they get a home game against the the Patriots, who, again, will likely need to air the ball out more than normal playing against the Patriots. We saw Tyreek Hill, a speedster, somewhat like Taylor Gabriel, right? We have the head coach of the Bears, who used Tyreek Hill to perfection last year. We saw Tyreek Hill just absolutely dominate the Pats last night. And now we have Taylor Gabriel in a similar spot. So this could be, again, a sneaky play for Taylor Gabriel. Now, I know it's easy to dismiss him, just given his boomer bust ability, but he looks to be a real part of this offense. I will say this. Uh, his his five targets on Sunday were a, a tie for a season low, which could be a good thing or a bad thing. It could be that, you know, maybe he's not as involved in the offense, but I would look at it as a good thing that you're getting at least five targets a game from Taylor Gabriel, who is seeing targets down the field, a lot of deep shots. So even if his targets are low, those targets are, are valuable. The bad part is we saw Anthony Miller return finally to game action on Sunday. He caught a touchdown um, and we saw Taylor Gabriel's snap count drop to 66%. In week six. Uh, it's the first time he has been under 74% of the snaps all season. It's something to monitor going forward between Miller and Taylor Gabriel. 
Um, but it seems like the Bears are pretty bent on, you know, getting the money that they spent on Gabriel this offseason uh, to full use. So Gabriel seems to be a big part of this offense. So they get uh, New England at home and then another home game against the Jets. Uh, and then they're at Buffalo. So he's someone you could probably use for the next couple weeks. And we'll move on to numero five, Chester Rogers of the Colts. 16% owned. Now Rodgers has hit double-digit targets. Double-digit, 10 or more targets in three straight games. There is no return timetable for Jack Doyle. There's no return timetable for T.Y. Hilton. Neither of them have even resumed practicing yet, so it seems um, I, would be, I would be very surprised if either of them uh, played in Week 7, um, if not missing more games after that. So it means Luck will have... But still a horrific group of pass catchers. Uh, I can't imagine, like, Luck's numbers would be incredible if... He's thrown some bad picks, but I feel like a large majority of his picks have just been throws off the hands of guys, and they've dropped so many touchdowns for Luck that have resulted in field goals instead of touchdowns. Uh, his numbers, that are already great for fantasy-wise, um, would be fucking ridiculous if, if his pass catchers were terrible. Or it weren't terrible. And uh, now you're looking at Ryan Grant, left week six with an ankle injury. Marcus Johnson, who was starting to get more playing time, caught a long touchdown pass from Andrew Luck in this game, uh, was carted off the field. So, like, any guy who's even looking at getting an expanded role is now hurt. And Chester Rogers, his floor and his ceiling is, is, up, is upgraded even more so. Um, he was already a very, 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 very high floor PPR play coming into this week. And with all these guys injured again, he will be a... Uh, another really good PPR play in Week 7 at home against the Buffalo Bills. This is an offense that is on pace for a historically high number of pass attempts this year. So Chester Rogers, get him in your lineup um, just from a volume standpoint. Number 6 is Christian Kirk, Arizona Cardinals, 14% owned. It seems like Larry Fitz has completely fallen off the face of the earth, and Christian Kirk has emerged as the top pass catching back, or uh, not back, uh, top pass catching weapon in Arizona. He, honestly, he's over David Johnson pretty much at this point. Um, and whatever value that actually holds, because this Cardinals offense is sheesh. Um, so he's, he's led the Cardinals now in back-to-back -back games in receiving yards, and he has 75 more, 75 yards or more receiving in three of their last four games. Now, Kirk is still running the majority of his routes on the outside, which I thought was going to be to his detriment entering the year. Right? I was like, if Kirk's not running from the slot, he might have problems. However, Fitz is still... <coughs> Fitz is still in the slot. That should be a good thing in Week 7 as they play the Denver Broncos at home. Now, Denver has not been good against the pass, or at least anywhere near what we expected them to be. Their best piece of secondary coverage is coming from Chris Harris, obviously, who plays the slot, who will cover Fitz for the majority of the game, leaving Christian Kirk on the outside. So this could be another game where Christian Kirk uh, surprises and puts up 75 or more receiving yards and catches, you know, five to six balls. They also play San Francisco in week eight at home, so it's two good matchups in a row that you could be able to play Kirk in your lineup. We'll move to the last wide receiver in this group, and that is Jermaine Curse of the New York Jets, 1% owned. Now hear me out. Pretty much, you know, I've been in love with Quincy Nunwa uh, all year, and uh, I was super excited when I got him off most of my waiver wires in week one. However, the downfall of Quincy started just after Jermaine, Cur uh, Jermaine Curse, you know, came back into the lineup and started immersing himself into more snaps in this offense. Now, with that, he started to slowly become the slot receiver for the New York Jets. Um, from weeks five to week six, he has run in the slot on 93% of his routes. On Sunday, he caught nine of 10 targets for 94 yards. That is something, you know, running from the slot is something that's going to lead to volume in this Jets offense. It's what we saw at the beginning of season from Quincy Nunwa, and that's why he was so valuable because it's clear that Darnold is going to target whoever is in the slot, and that's why Nunwa was seeing 25 to 30 percent of the targets. Um, those 10 targets that Jermaine Kearse saw on Sunday were 33 percent of Darnold's 30 pass attempts in the game. That's a massive share, and that's why we were so high on Nunwa in the beginning, and now Kearse is running from the slot, not Nunwa. Now, the bigger news and the more, oh, fuck yeah, <laughs> I just saw an update that, uh, Mike Smith, defensive coordinator for the Bucks, got fired. I don't even know how he was still in the league, honestly. He was the worst fucking coach ever for the Falcons. I thought he honestly, I thought he didn't get hired again anywhere else until I saw him on TV this year as the Bucks defensive coordinator. And I was like, ah, oh, that explains why the Bucks defense is so fucking bad. Mike Smith, I ain't even going to say shit like that. But the bigger news, going back to Jermaine Kearse. Anuma left week six game with an ankle injury, and he couldn't put any weight on it. He, he did not return. So it's possible Nunwa misses 
time going forward. However, if he misses time, I'm now I'm kind of nervous that Jermaine Curse might move to the outside, which would be a mis not a mistake, but it would be bad news for him from a fantasy perspective. Um, regardless, it should re result in a, a volume bump if Anunua misses time. Next week, they take on Minnesota at home, who again, just like Denver, have not lived up to their passing defense hype entering 2018. Um, and they just lost their first round rookie pick, cornerback Mike Hughes, for the year with a torn ACL. So it could quietly be Jermaine Kerr's season in week seven. Um, so he's someone to absolutely keep an eye on. We'll move over to the tight end position. Um, I'm not going to break down guys guy by guy by guy because there's just like seven guys you can possibly stream. But it, I just want it's like funny how the pendulum swings when it comes to tight ends in the fantasy landscape, especially with streaming. Like everyone just goes off last week's game. Like Vance McDonald, for instance, right? Had two really good weeks in a row. Everyone picked him up. Then he had his dud game in week five. Everyone dropped him. Then he bounces back in week six, catching seven passes for 68 yards. He should be owned in your league if you need a tight end. He's clearly the most athletic pass-catching tight end in that offense. He's clearly a big piece of that offense. I know they have a buy in week seven, so maybe don't pick him up now. But McDonald is very good, and he's going to be more involved going forward. So I understand he had a bad game. That doesn't mean that you need to drop him every week and then add him every week and then blah, 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 blah. Also, O.J. Howard should be scooped up in every single league. I don't know why people, I mean, I understand why people were dropping him, obviously, because he was hurt, but um, he probably shouldn't have been dropped in the first place. And now he's available in 44% of Yahoo League. So please get him. He went uh, four for 62, caught another touchdown in Winston's first game back on Sunday. He outsnapped Cameron Brait 34 to 22. And that was something that we uh, had seen in the beginning of the year. Howard was far out snapping Cameron Brait, and then obviously the knee injury occurred and he was playing less time and we expected him to kind of get worked back into the offense slowly because the timetable was supposed to be two to four weeks he came back right after their bye week and uh and then he already out snapped Brait. so Brait caught a touchdown but Howard's going to be way more involved going forward and I love that with Winston in the lineup so OJ Howard is definitely the number one waiver wire grab for tight ends this week if he is available in your league CJ Uzuma Zoma, whatever, of the Bengals, unsurprisingly played well in this one, caught six of seven targets for 54 yards, um, and should continue to provide a pretty safe floor if you need a tight end to stream week over week with Eifert out for the year. Tyler Croft has been in a walking boot. Uh, his next two matchups are at Tampa Bay and versus Kansas City. So they are two of the top three friendliest teams in all of fantasy football when it comes to letting up fantasy points to the tight end position. Uh, Ozoma, or Zuma, whatever the hell you say it, will be pretty much be a top 12 fantasy tight end um, by default over those next two weeks. Ricky Seals Jones is the last guy on this list who bounced back in week six, right? He didn't catch a single of his six targets in week five, which was highly disappointing, but he has seen six targets in back-to-back -back weeks. He caught five of them for 69 yards against Minnesota in this last game. Now he gets Denver in week seven at home, and Denver has been the fourth friendliest fantasy defense to opposing tight ends this year. So he's not a terrible streaming option either. And uh, lastly, we have defensive streamers, defensive special teams. And always, guys, the three things I look for in defensive team, defensive fantasy teams is favorites to win the game, at home in low over under totals. This week, we have Denver Broncos. They're playing at Arizona, so they do not fit the home bill, but they're playing at Arizona. Um, they're 44% owned. They are favorited to win the game, minus two and a half. And I'm not so worried about them being at home if they're favored to win the game, because usually being at home, like, works itself into the spread. So minus two and a half, um, over under 40 and a half points. So they do not expect a lot of points to be scored in this one, which is always a good thing when you are streaming defenses. The second on this list is the Redskins. They're at home versus the Dallas Cowboys, 6% owned, minus one and a half. So they're one and a half point favorites in this one, a low over under of 41 and a half points. Uh, I really like the Redskins who have been a quietly good defense, especially at home this year, to have a good um, fantasy performance in week seven. If I had to put like the fourth option as to whether or not I stream a defense, it comes down to whether or not they're a real good defense in real life. Like you could be like, you could find a few guys that fit into that criteria. I think, I think the Colts are, Colts are at home. I don't know, but like the Colts have a bad defense. You don't really want to stream them because they're just not a good defense overall. So look for a good defense if you're trying to have a tie break between the two. And, and that's going to wrap it up for this week's waiver wire episode. If you enjoyed, if you got value, I would highly appreciate a thumbs up. Uh, drop a comment down below. Let me know what you think. Let me know what questions you have for the upcoming week. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. We do this every single week, hopefully bringing y'all the chip to your league this year. If you're on the podcast, a rating and review would also be highly appreciated. Let's me know that you want me to keep doing these. Anyways, that is it, and I will see y'all on Thursday. Peace.